Okay, so uh, hi everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for being here. I'm um, mostly thanks uh, to Jaco for the opportunity to present this uh, work. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be here in this series of seminars. So uh, as Jacob uh, already mentioned, this is a work I did in collaboration with my colleague Flavio del Santo from the University of Geneva. And uh, it's uh, the, the talk is gonna be uh, based on an article that is already uploaded uh, on the archive with, uh, with the same title. And as the title already quite suggests, it's an, it's an open uh, criticism to, to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, Everettian quantum mechanics, or other words, uh, other titles that you may, uh, that, that these uh, sort of interpretations uh, take. Uh, I'm going to do a, a, a three minor remarks at the beginning on what is this criticism about. First, it is um, a criticism at the philosophical level of the, of the interpretation, so we are not going to enter into uh, uh, any subtle technicalities of the of the interpretation or of the many variants of the interpretation that that exist. Uh, so um, that's why I'm I'm gonna be a little bit loose about some of the technicalities. Of course, if you uh, like to work in this uh, interpretation, they may be important, but we don't think they are that important for uh, the kind of criticism that we do. That is at the uh, say at the core of the basic um, assumption that these uh, assumptions that this interpretation means in our opinion in order to to account for quantum mechanical uh, phenomena second we uh, criticize uh, we let me put it like this we take the interpretation seriously so we criticize the ontological proposal of of the existence of these many worlds multiverses parallel universes um, and, or again, the different names that they that they get. I say this because in some other times I gave the talk, some people take the view that, okay, an interpretation is just an interpretation in the sense it's a tale you tell yourself in order to keep track and in order to, you know, uh, be able to understand in your head uh, uh, what is going on in, in quantum mechanical experiments. Uh, in this sense, we don't criticize that, but simply because you can tell a million of different tales uh, about so many phenomena in nature, and this does not mean that you believe they are true the way you are telling them, and they may account for certain aspects of 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 the um, of the phenomena you are perceiving, but this does not mean that you're taking to be true. No, if you are interested in understanding, I don't know, the wind that you receive in the morning in your window, you may think that there is a big creature far away uh, that is blowing and gives you the wind. Maybe it's useful for, for, for you to understand the wind, but this doesn't mean that you truly believe that the creature exists or that only all the consequences of this creature are gonna be holding. So in this sense, uh, we take this quote by David Deutsch, who says that uh, calling many words an interpretation is as unfair as, as calling the um, calling the existence of dinosaurs an interpretation of the fossils that we see of dinosaurs today. No, we don't think that the existence that dinosaurs are interpretations of any fossils. We do believe that exist that they existed. And in the same way we should believe that many worlds existed. So what we were not always try to hold this uh, interpretation accountable of that statement. And we believe it's gonna be failing in in being possibly accountable of that statement they are trying to do. And third, uh, very briefly, uh, you know that already other criticisms, there are plenty of criticisms to many worlds interpretation or variety in quantum. Just to quantum. note, Louise, are you uh, yeah. moving through your slides because it still shows the cover slide? No, 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 yeah, yeah, no. I, I'm, I wanted to make just a few ah, remarks. Okay, the good. I will, no worries. Uh, so, yes, uh, as you know, there are uh, plenty of criticisms already. That have to do okay. How you account with for probabilities? What is the special base base in which the measurement takes place? When does the branching happen? We share some of these criticisms, but for the sake of this talk, we can as well assume that they that somehow the proposals of many worlds have managed to overcome them, and they have and the and the theories as as 
self consistent as as one would would uh, desire, right? And we will try to show that in spite of that, because of its very core assumptions, uh, it cannot be held as a tenable theory in, in natural science. Very quickly, the applying of the of the talk, I will go through a quick introduction in which I will briefly visit the famous measurement problem in quantum mechanics and how the many worlds aims to account and to solve the, the measurement problem. And already there, I'm going to do a very uh, quick, a big spoiler on what our main criticism is. And, um, and basically, the rest of the talk is going to be going a little bit around in circles uh, around this idea, around the, this core criticism on, on, on some assumptions that are taken in order to uh, supposedly solve the measurement problem and why they lead, why they are not tenable, right? So the rest of the talk is going to be uh, going around uh, this core uh, idea that they will already propose there. The second part, it's going to be, I'm going to give some very um, basic philosophical assumptions that we take about natural science as a human endeavor. Uh, and with them, I'm going to basically revisit this same criticism that we do to many worlds uh, interpretation but from a, from a generic point of view so it's going to be like a revisit but instead of being a criticism to many worlds interpretation i'm going to introduce the argument which we call the holistic inference loop which we that's what we call the main problem that we believe many worlds uh, shows uh, i'm going to present it but simply in a generic way, in a more generic uh, way, more philosophical way. And with that in mind, I want to go back and revisit with this generic structure, revisit back again many worlds interpretation and try to give further uh, arguments on why indeed uh, many worlds uh, interpretation falls into this problematic uh, conceptual structure of the holistic inference loop and I will do so by using a couple of uh, graphical examples. So this part is going to be more like uh, trying to show different angles and different perspectives on the core idea to, well, possibly make it more clear. And finally, we'll finish with some brief discussion. So uh, first, measurement problem. So as you know, the measurement problem, one, one way of posing it is that in textbook quantum mechanics, we are given two possible evolutions for quantum systems. One is the unitary evolution by the Schrodinger equation, which is deterministic. Uh, and for example, one example of those would be uh, the case of a particle going through a beam splitter, right? I'm using like intuitive notation here, right? Where we get the this state of the particle with the particle going up is mm, evolves into a state in which the particle is in a quantum superposition of two possible trajectories. And we do know that this is uh, not just uh, the state being either up or down, but rather a coherent quantum superposition, which is a state on its own with its own properties. And we can check that through interferometric experiments, so on and so forth. So this is one sort of evolution. But we have uh, in textbook quantum mechanics, another evolution, which is given by the measurement uh, postulate and the collapse postulate, which say, okay, if, for example, we take now this uh, state that we uh, found after the beam splitter and we just project it on a screen, what we find at the empirical level, and this is uh, correctly described by textbook quantum mechanics, is that 50% of the times we find that the particle went up 50 times 50% of the time we find, well, rather that the particle is found on the top of the uh, screen and half, half of the time it's found at the bottom of the screen. And this is a probabilistic, unpredictable behavior that happens instantaneously and it's not describable by, by, by the Schrodinger equation with an unitary evolution. And the question would be, okay, uh, why, uh, why is it in some cases that this is the evolution and in other cases this is the evolution and what makes a measurement a measurement and so on and so forth. There are different proposals to solve these depending on the interpretations of quantum mechanics. And the many worlds proposal is to reject the second uh, kind of evolution as fundamental and rather propose that everything 
evolves accordingly to unitary evolution of pure wave mechanics, right? So for example, the description of the previous experiment by uh, variety and quantum mechanics would be to say, okay, everything is quantum mechanical, not only the particle, but also the screen, and also the experiment that is gonna do the experiment. And there's an unitary evolution by which before the experimenter goes and checks what the result has been, you would get a sort of entanglement between the particle, the traject the particle's trajectory and the spot on the screen like this. And then once the experimenter uh, goes and check the, 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 the point on the screen, this keeps going as, a, as an unitary evolution. The experimenter is, is made of matter that is describable with quantum mechanics, so why not? And then the experimenter gets further entangled and you get a quantum superposition of the experimenter perceiving the spot up or perceiving the spot down. And, and But this is all full unitary evolution. And what this last um, uh, state describes is not a concrete state of the experimenter, but rather a collection of two parallel worlds or universes in one of which the experimenter is perceiving the, the, the spot up and in the other the spot down. But the true reality of the experimenter is that of both universes at the same time described by this complete uh, wave. And, and this is it. There's no collapse. There's no nothing. Then different constructions may manage to show how this whole evolution is perceived subjectively by the observer as a probabilistic evolution, but this is just a subjective perception. Nothing probabilistic is happening and everything is wave mechanics. Okay, this is briefly the account by many worlds interpretation. What do we criticize? Okay, we criticize the use made on the assumption of universality of quantum mechanics in this experiment. And in particular, the assumption, the use made of the assumption that the experimenter is also a quantum mechanical system in all its degrees, so not only its position or anything, but rather all the processes that undergo in, the, in his brain or her brain that lead to the perception of a spot on the screen and so on and so forth. You need to admit that all that is describable with quantum mechanics because this is the assumption you're doing in order to be able to write this last, uh, this last step of the evolution, right? Well, we criticize the use of that assumption. Um, we don't think that this is a legitimate assumption to be made in order to understand the empirical evidence that we have about this simple experiment, right? This is a criticism. If I would have to summarize it, I would call it like this, right? The rest of the talk is going to be a more detailed a description of why uh, this is a legitimate criticism and why this should lead to the projection of the theory as a tenable theory. So first uh, concern that probably uh, some people may have is, okay, why this is not a valid assumption? I mean, what's going wrong when one has a theory in physics or in natural science, one can pretend to that it applies to all the elements involved in the experiment. And if one succeeds in, in describing the empirical evidence that this is a success of the theory, it's not a failure, it's not a, an illegitimate assumption, that's how things work, no? So why are you saying so? Well, let me make an emphasis on a word I use. We don't criticize an assumption of the universality of quantum mechanics. We criticize the use made of that assumption. Because think of it. I think in this experiment, we are not interested in understanding the experimenter's brain in particular, or how the experimenter's brain is understood with quantum mechanics. Actually, I don't know of anybody that has written any Hamiltonian of what somebody's brain or anything the like. We are trying to understand this. The fact that he put an experimenter is almost accidental. He could have put anything else. And I will further argue uh, by the end of the talk why sh one, we should, in order to keep the consistency of this description, we must possibly put anything else. I will further argue on that, but I think it's quite intuitive, right? We could have put a experimenter or, or maybe a cat to check. 
So we would need to assume in order to keep the consistency of this result, which let me uh, let me emphasize this is this is a very stable um, empirical result we find for a particle and a screen, and that's all, regardless of what might be affected by the screen by the spot on the screen afterwards. This is a stable result. We should uh, reproduce it if we want to account for quantum mechanics, regardless of what may be affected later by this. But again, what may be affected could be possibly anything. Again, it could be a cat. And if we want to account for the empirical evidence, we would need to assume the cat is quantum mechanical. We can typically, this is a very typical experiment in quantum mechanics, we could typically kill the cat, depending on the result. And if we want to understand the consistency of that, and the consistency of that, which has nothing more than the consistency of the fact that we get a concrete result in this experiment, we need to assume that quantum mechanics applies to the, all the processes that lead to the life or the death of a cat. We need to. Again, not in order to understand the cat, in order to understand the consistency of this result. Because this is the account we are giving of the consistency of this result. There could be others. There are others. But this is the one that many worlds interpretation is given. So in other words, many worlds requires the assumption of universality of quantum mechanics, not just as a formal statement of saying, hey, this is the best theory we have so far. And we should, in principle, assume that it is applying to anything we find until we happen to find that it doesn't do something. No. It's rather the opposite. You require the assumption of universality in order to understand each and every single simple empirical uh, experiment that you do in quantum mechanics, in particular this one, right? Because if, for example, say quantum mechanics did not apply for some reason to the brain of cats, then if you try to do this experiment with a cat, you would get compromised. Because I believe that we all agree that if we do the experiment with a cat, the cat will find 50% of the times the point up and 50% the point times the point down. And with that, with a cat, with a cow, or with whatever we want. This is the core um, criticism. Let me uh, put it in more, like, say, philosophical terms. So uh, I, for that, I'm going to introduce in a more generic way, this sort of, of uh, conceptual structure in which you assume universality as a necessary condition in order to account for each and every single experiment or in each, uh, each and every single empirical evidence that you pretend to reproduce with a theory. And this is what we call the holistic inference loop. So in order to, uh, to justify what by this holistic inference loop is not a tenable construction in, in natural science, we have uh, numbered a series of three basic assumptions on natural science as, as a sort of human endeavor, right? Of course, we don't pretend that this exhausts the discussion on, on what, uh, what empirical science or natural science is about, rather the opposite. We believe that this uh, statements could be shared by a wide variety of, of position metaphysical positions about about uh, um, about science more realistic or phenomenological or empiricist or whatever uh, and these are three basic statements we do first empirical data that we have is limited by our range of observations we mean it means we can never be completely sure that we have exhausted all possible uh, empirical data and all possible empirical phenomena we may ever access. At some point to the current day, we haven't we didn't find anything that we can't describe with quantum mechanics, but we cannot be sure that in ten years, hundred years, million years, something pops up. Right? We can't never be sure. So we have to admit that our experience of the world is limited in this sense. Second, that scientific theories are human creation. And I say this from a very materialistic perspective. It is us so far that we know that we happen to do uh, write down theories that are our creation. We don't find theories out there written in our language, right? 
in science. Mm -hmm. In other disciplines, like say uh, in religion, you believe that you find uh, laws or, or truths written out there in a language that is uh, the same as us. Well, this is this is a way of approaching the the um, the knowledge peculiar to religions or or any other at least some religions, but not to science. In science, we don't find the equations. We write the equations ourselves. What we find is the empirical evidence, the phenomena. Uh, and finally, what is our goal in in natural science is to account for empirical evidence of the phenomena and to have theories that, uh, sorry, that I repeat, uh, to find theories that are account for the empirical evidence of phenomena uh, that are self-consistent. Of course, this is third point is a matter of degree, right? No theory is 100% in agreement with empirical evidence and probably no theory is 100% consistent. But yeah, this is our desideratum, right? And finally, we write down what we say is a necessary condition of tenability, which is that for a scientific theory should to be tenable, uh, it needs to not to collide with these basic facts about natural science, about how science is done itself. This is what we state, and this is what we use in order to say that uh, theory centered in the holistic inference loop, and in particular many worlds interpretation, are not tenable. Of course, there can be a legitimate disagreement on this, so let me put it like this. The more you agree, we believe, with these facts about natural science, the more you will agree with our conclusions about many worlds interpretation. Probably the more you disagree, the more you will disagree with our conclusions. So, uh, that being said, what is the holistic inference loop? Let me put a super basic, uh, probably this is the most stupid scheme one can one can uh, one can paint on a on a slide, but it's a scheme of a validation of a theory. No, you have a theory T, you have some phenomena, and you have experimental evidence of these phenomena. So if the theory reproduces the experimental evidence, you say that the theory applies to that phenomenon. That that's all to it. As I said, this is this is I'm using this scheme only as a tool in order to explain what we call the holistic inference loop. This is the holistic inference loop. Let me go through it. <clears throat> Imagine that again, you find some phenomena that you want to explain with a natural a theory, natural science, but in the connection that you have between the theory and the experimental evidence, so in the in the series of arguments that you do in order to say that your theory is reproducing some concrete experimental evidence, you have about a concrete experiment you're doing about some concrete phenomena. In this series of arguments, you call a hypothesis. You make this series of arguments depending on hypothesis that we call the holistic hypothesis. And this hypothesis is that the theory also applies to other phenomena. And this phenomena, we say, that has to be arbitrary phenomena. I will go back into, into what we try to mean by arbitrary phenomena, okay? So you make, so again, this connection between the theory and its capacity to reproduce experimental evidence is not direct. It's relying on a hypothesis, and this hypothesis has to do with, the, with your assumption that the theory applies to also something else. This something else being arbitrary. Uh, and then only if that holds, then the theory reproduces empirical evidence, and, the, and then you can say that the theory applies to the phenomena P. Okay. Uh, again, what we mean by arbitrary phenomena is uh, basically phenomena that you cannot uh, delimit, that you cannot uh, in a finite series of of of, of of uh, um, say statements make a delimitation of it, right? That it's uh, uh, impossible to embrace with a finite set of experiments, with a um, with a finite series of of, uh, of experimental observations, right? For example, and the particular example of the of the um, 
of the many worlds interpretation if you assume that T applies to everything. If it applies to any phenomena, I mean, how can you ever be sure that, and how can you experimentally embrace all possible phenomena whatsoever, okay? So uh, this is what we call uh, arbitrary phenomena. And in particular, pretending that P is yes, universal, it's the most, if you wish, extreme example of a phenomena you can never exhaust with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with experimental, um, with experimental verification. So, uh, so this is one of the ingredients that we require for, uh, for, um, for saying that the theory enters uh, the holistic inference loop. That holistic hypothesis really embrace, uh, really assumes some arbitrary phenomena. To that the theory applies to some arbitrary phenomena, right? But then the other ingredient is quite critical. I, these are the two that I put in red here. Is that claiming a holistic hypothesis on its own is not problematic per se. Many theories formally claim that they are universal or that they apply to an indefinite ser series of elements that you could not uh, embrace with any finite uh, experimental research. The problem is when you make this hypothesis a necessary condition in each and every experiment you do. This is the peculiarity of the structure of the holistic inference loop, right? When you do that, it's when you're in trouble, okay? And uh, finally here, we uh, depict what somehow the, 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 uh, the sort of reasoning that closes a loop, which is uh, this, um, holistic inference, that's that's why we call it the holistic inference loop, which means, okay, why on earth would anyone propose a holistic inference, a holistic hypothesis on, on the first place for some theory? Well, the only plausible reason is that one has already a lot, or one thinks that one already has a lot of uh, experimental evidence about this theory, right? One says, okay, I think this theory really applies to a lot of phenomena, so why not considering that it may be actually say universal or actually I can extrapolate it to some other arbitrary phenomena. This is a sort of inference. Again, doing so is not bad, it's just a hypothesis. It can be a guiding hypothesis. And actually in theories that, uh, that we had uh, in, in physics many times it was a guiding hypothesis. Okay, if I have a good theory, I will try to work with the assumption that it's going to be applying to next things I will be encountering. But just that, the problem is when you close a loop, and I insist on that again, the problem is when your assumption becomes a necessary condition because you restructure your theory and you make this assumption a necessary condition in your understanding of each and every supposed empirical verification you have. Because this, theory, this this hypothesis is impossible to fully prove. But then also each supposed verification of the theory is not valid anymore. And then of course the whole loop is not uh, uh, sustained in any empirical ground. Okay, uh, this is, as I said, that's the generic construction that we have identified in the um, in the many walls interpretation, I think that the, it's not it's quite immediate to identify the construction with the previous argumentation I did, right? As I said, in the uh, in the many walls interpretation, in order to account for the empirical fact that each time we do a quantum measurement, we find a single outcome. In order to account for that, in each and every of the quantum experiments you do you rely on the assumption that that what becomes affected by that uh, single outcome is also quantum mechanics. And that what becomes affected by an outcome is quite an arbitrary phenomenon. It's actually, and I will further argue that it must, if you want to be consistent, you must admit that it has to be any possible phenomena whatsoever, otherwise you're in trouble. So clearly many walls interpretation and then the holistic inference loop. Okay, that being said, 
let me, as I said, revisit um, the many walls interpretation uh, in view of this generic construction uh, with a couple of, of say, uh, graphical examples and graphical stories. And the first one, I called it the many walled castaway. So let me tell you a brief story. Uh, this is Bob, right? And he's a many world physicist. He is a theoretical physicist and he strongly supports uh, many worlds interpretation. And doing a travel to a conference, uh, he has a, a, a plane airplane accident in the Pacific Ocean, just like uh, Tom Hanks in the movie, right? And he happens to end up uh, as a castaway on an island but more likely than, than Tom Hanks in the movie, he happens to arrive to an island that is not inhabited, but rather is inhabited by people that due to some weird reason that we are not gonna address, have become have been disconnected from the from civilization since the 19th century, basically, late 19th century. Right? So I've called it the classical islands. Probably they wouldn't call themselves classical island, but okay, doesn't matter. And he goes there. He's welcomed by these people. They help him to recover from the from the accident. And then he they ask him, okay, what are you doing? Okay, I'm a theoretical physicist. Oh, nice. We have a theoretical physicist here in the island. It's Alice. So let let us introduce you to Alice, and you can talk physics. So they start talking physics and Bob asks Alice, okay, what, what kind of physics do you do here in the island? I'm curious, you know? And Alice says, well, you know, the, the stuff that works, Newtonian mechanics, uh, Newton's law of gravitation, thermodynamics, uh, electromagnetism, Maxwell equations. Uh, I mean, we, there are some things we are not convinced about that don't seem to fit, you know, like matter interaction, the existence of ether, but so far we didn't find anything better. So still we are working on this. We we didn't find anything that's like, hey, this is impossible to 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 explain. And then Bob says, okay, you're super out of date. I mean, we found out there two incredible theories that really overcome uh, 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 these old ones you are using, right? It's general relativity and quantum mechanics. So Alice is curious. So, okay, show them to me, and I'm I'm eager to know about this new physics. So they go with, let's say general general relativity first. Um, Bob is a theoretician, so Bob introduces first the formalism. He likes to do it like this. And Alice is super wise, so he she manages to absorb everything on. Uh, manifolds, curvature, um, um, Einstein equations, geodesic, light cons, causality, or so on and so forth. She says, okay, very nice, uh, very nice theory, quite weird, quite uh, mind blowing. Can you show it to me in action? Can you show me that it reproduces empirical evidence out there? And Bob says, but of course, yes, of course, it's a physical theory. We need to check it experimentally. And Bob is also quite wise and happens to be quite uh, uh, quite imaginative in overcoming the technical difficulties in the island. And they happen to, I don't know, do a series of experiments. They measure some uh, some blue shift, some gravitational blue shift here in a tower, or they wait for a solar eclipse and check that you know, the, the light bending by, by gravity, or they measure the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. And Alice is, is astonished, she's super convinced. She says, okay, this is a theory. It manages to reproduce concrete experimental evidence you put on the table incredibly well. So I'm convinced this is, this is very nice. It, it really overcomes Newtonian uh, gravity and Newtonian mechanics. What about the other? What about quantum mechanics? And then Bob is, as I said, he's a convinced aberration. And he says, okay, uh, mm, here I have an incredible chance to do something. Alice has never heard about quantum mechanics. She has never heard about collapse, measurement, Heisenberg card, concrete results popping up, uh, probabilities, nothing like that. 
it is not polluted by all these confusing ideas that some people have got to know in in in, uh, in textbook quantum mechanics, and they too easy to so difficult to give up later on and to realize so to realize that this is not fundamental. So why why don't I try something else? Why shouldn't I try to just tell her the truth from the beginning? Pure quantum wave mechanics. That's all to it. And then when it comes to the framing, I will tell her what's going on. But let's not confuse her at the beginning. Let, I will go with the pure formalism in theoretician. I will go with the pure formalism on, on wave mechanics. And then I will make her to understand the experiment. So Bob is enthusiastic. She's, he says, OK, this is a unique experience, right? Like, I've been quite lucky. I caught a very nice branch of the wave function, if, if you wish. So he proceeds like that. He tells uh, Alice the formalism of, of, of quantum mechanics, uh, Schrodinger equation, unitary evolution, Hilbert spaces, uh, all that formalism. And Alice is also mind blown by, by, this, by this incredible, weird, uh, uh, formal abstract theory. And she says, OK, fine. I, I, I swallowed all the formalism. Please show it to me in action. And, and Bob says, but of course, uh, let's let's approach some simple frame and let's do an Stengel experiment. So they go, they write down, he writes down the state for for a particle coming out of a of a, of a beam of particles as being one half particle, right? Um, he decides to prepare it in this uh, state like this. I should have included in part of the quantum mechanical explicit description by, by Bob, uh, the, the starting uh, velocity of the particle, which would be like purely horizontal, right? I, I, I forgot that that, uh, that cat here, right? So the initial state of the particle is in this quantum superposition and it's uh, going horizontally. And then of course he, he gives uh, Alice the Hamiltonian of the unitary evolution in here, uh, and, and and so far that's it. He stops there, and then Alice does the computation with this unitary evolution, and and uh, and with the with the initial state given, and compares to the empirical evidence, and she says, "Okay, Bob, I I have troubles with you. I I don't understand. I don't think this is this this is working, right? Because you gave me your Hamiltonian uh, and your unitary, like computed unitary evolution with this initial state, and it stopped here. I mean, I mean she doesn't say stop here because she's not seeing all these, uh, uh, these, these other parts, right? I computed this. So Alice would have computed up to here, right? Forget about these other cats. Alice has computed that, but I have computed that, that my Particle got what you called entangled. I think it, this is with with with. The, so the spin got entangled with the direction. But this is all what I got. This is a state. But this is not what I see. What I see in the in the in the um, in the screen, it has half of the times the particle goes up and half of the time it goes down. So while with with your equation, I always get the same result. Which by the way, I wouldn't know how to interpret. To be honest, what what should I find on the screen to see that I got this evolution. So I'm confused. God, Bob's, uh, Bob's um, expects that, right? And uh, and he says, yeah, uh, Alice, but you didn't notice uh, the screen is also quantum mechanical. You didn't take that into account. So you have to include it in the evolution. And Alice says, OK, so quantum mechanics also applies to screens and spots on the screens. Okay, I buy it. You're gonna have to show me that, Bob, later. Because I thought we were trying to understand the spin of a particle and you're telling me now about spots on the screen and creation of spots on the screen. You will have to show me later, but then I buy. But okay, I buy. And then, um, but then she says, okay, but then if I do that, I compute this and she would stop in here. So this is still not what I get. This is not the state I get. I don't get this this cat. I get just half of the times up, half of the times down. I don't understand. 
Cloud could say, okay, but you're not taking into account that also the light coming from the string is quantum mechanical and so on. And in the end, he would need to end by saying, okay, you are not understanding Ali. You are also a quantum mechanical object. You have to take into account this and you have to put yourself in the evolution. And then this is evolution and then this means two worlds and so on and so forth. Alice says, okay, Bob, stop it there. I, I, I don't buy this. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, I, I can't buy this. Uh, what are what are you talking about? Why should I admit that I'm a quantum mechanic? What he says, oh, Bob, of course, says, okay, I know this is super counterintuitive, the existence of parallel universes. That's and Alice says, no, no, I don't have special problems with that. I mean, it's counterintuitive. They could, but what I'm telling you is, why should I assume that I'm discoverable with quantum mechanics? I have you, you, this is a new theory to me. I have no evidence of it. No evidence whatsoever. You haven't still given me a single empirical evidence yet. And you pretend that I first assumed that it describes my whole brain before I can trust that I get one empirical evidence. Why should on earth I do that? This is, I hope, a way of visualizing quite graphically why you really need to first assume an universal application, because again, and I will go into that in a, in a minute, and with this I will finish. I'm standing more than I expected. Uh, but this is a graphical example, and really, you need first to assume an universal application before you can say that it applies to single, to single empirical evidences, to the most simple uh, uh, quantum experiment you can do. So somehow you can see here how many worlds interpretation is using the empirical success of other interpretations. Because of course, as soon as Bob starts talking about outcomes of measurement, probabilities, collapse, whatever, then everything will become at least provisionally clear to Alice. Then may, she may be confused about the measurement problems just as much as we are. But at least she would say, okay, I understand empirical evidence to some extent. But uh, until he does not pronounce that, at the fundamental level, Alice needs first to believe in quantum mechanics applies, applying to her own brain before she has any reason to believe that quantum mechanics applies to a spin one half particle. Okay. Last thing is, okay, could we close the loop? Could we maybe stop on, on Alice's consciousness? Then it could be close. It could be hard for Alice, but Alice says, okay, I admit that my consciousness uh, is describable with quantum mechanics. And then I work hard and then I start to understand some of the some of the some of the uh, some of the results of the experiments, and I just need to work hard to fully understand my brain, quite hard, I would say, and understand that all oh, this is describable with quantum mechanics, and then I get a holistic picture that is fine. It finishes at my consciousness, and then that's it. Well, we don't think this is the case. We really think that in order to keep consistency, you really need that quantum mechanics is strictly universal, otherwise you have problems with many worlds interpretation. Problems, again, to describe each and every single uh, quantum experiment. And let me go with the yellow-green flag experiment. And this is the, the, the last part of the, of the talk. So imagine that we do, again, uh, a quantum experiment having to do with the um, measurement and spin one-half particle in stein gerlach device, and yes, with the same setup as before, and Depending on the trajectory of the, oh, sorry, depending on the trajectory of the of the particle, we make some device to raise either a yellow flag or a green flag. Okay, and that's it. Of course, a many worlds interpretation would be not that a yellow flag popped up or a green flag popped up, popped up, but rather that everything got entangled. And the fact that you see a yellow or a green flag is that you are getting entangled. That's 
But importantly, many words interpretation says no definite result is showing up. The true reality of the flag is not being yellow or being green. It's always a quantum mechanical superposition. Okay, question. Can I use the color of the flag now from here on as empirical evidence? Simple question. Then many worlds may tell you, I would say most of the supports of many worlds may tell you, yes, of course, it has become basically so much the coherent that yes, I mean, for all practical purposes, you will be able to use a yellow flag and admit that it's basically yellow and it will behave as a yellow flag for anything else you do. But why is it so? Because the flag is yellow? No. Because anything you put to interact with the flag will interact in each branch as if the flag was of the color that you see in the branch. For example, imagine that we are trying to test how a fly perceives the, the flag. Okay, then this is what happens. So then in each branch, you start you stay consistently thinking that the flag is yellow or the flag is green. So everything is fine. It's an empirical evidence. But why you can keep this consistently? Because the fly is quantum. This is the only way that many walls interpretation has to keep the consistency of that empirical evidence we have found in the experiment. But what if we wanted to check some other system that we don't know if we are, if it's quantum mechanical or not, anything. For example, I decided to put a blue unicorn. Could be anything. We don't know if unicorns are quantum mechanical or not. We don't know if they are describable with quantum mechanics. So if I try to make the unicorn interact with the flag, of course, flag taking a, a, symbol, a symbol of some result of some measurement, uh, some quantum measurement, should I think that the flag is yellow? Why? The flag is not yellow. That's not true. Then how should I understand? And the unicorn is not quantum mechanical. I don't know if it's going to get entangled. I don't know what it's going to do with the reality of the flag. I can't predict. So how should I think about the unicorn interacting with the flag? Should I think that the flag is in this, sta in this state? But not quite either, because if you think about it, I mean, the very fact that I did the experiment in the first place the fact that I have a flag on the first place, the fact that I'm there doing the experiment in the first place, all these are to a great extent, and we don't know that, consequences of outcomes of quantum measurements, even if we have not been consciously aware and we did not do them in a lab as a quantum experiment. There are plenty of quantum things happening around us, according to, to, to many worlds, actually everything. But uh, at least many things I completely agree are can be accounted for as consequence of, of, of quantum measurement. So why should I believe that a unicorn is going to interact with a flag? I don't have a flag. I interact consistently with having a flag because I get entangled with that. But in all the universes, I don't have it. Why would the unicorn keep interacting consistently with that? It doesn't need to. So how should I conceptualize a unicorn or a, how can I test a unicorn in the first place? I can't. I have to give up if I try to keep consistency with my quantum many worlds interpretation account of the flag of, and of the particle and of the spin, I need to give up the possibility of using any empirical evidence around me to test post-quantum systems because I don't know if they are going to be consistent with it. But this means that post quantum systems, such as we, in order to keep many worlds interpretation of quantum systems, we just make post quantum systems by definition inaccessible. By definition, right? Because it's, we cannot use empirical evidence to test them. Sounds a weird conclusion, but it's quite natural. Many worlds interpretation has assumed the universality of quantum mechanics. It cannot embrace. Not again, I'm not asking quantum mechanics to explain the blue unicorn. I am saying that the blue unicorn is possibly post quantum. What I'm saying is it cannot coexist, it cannot co live with consistently with existence 
of things that go beyond quantum mechanics. Why? Because it's assuming universality as an as an uh, omnipresent requisite. If universality breaks, then all quantum mechanical descriptions break. And this is the other chance. If you say, this is the chance I plot here. If you say, okay, well, no, I want to test blue unicorns and I want to test possible post-quantum experiments, right? Uh, sorry, possible post-quantum phenomena. I want to check it. And of course, you will need to rely on some empirical evidence around you. I'm using the, the flag, but just symbolically, it could be anything. As soon as you use something as empirical evidence, of course, you your your study of the of the post quantum system will consist on comparing it with empirical evidence. So, if you see a yellow flag, you will conceptualize the results according to okay, when the flag is yellow, that happens. When the flag is green, that happens. And you will try to find those consistencies. If you don't like the flag, take anything else, whatever. And you will find behaviors of the blue unicorn that, depending on the color of the flag, he will do this or that or whatever. But then, if the blue unicorn happens not to be quantum mechanical, how is it that this survives? It may not. It may, but it may not. It now depends on the blue unicorn. Maybe the blue unicorn is not possibly in quantum superposition. Think of say Penrose gravity. Imagine that we find such a such a system, something that cannot be held in quantum superposition. Then what happens to the rest of the universe? The quantum mechanical description of the flag and of the particle, and of the quantum mechanical meaning the many worlds interpretation of the flag, of the of the particle trajectory and of the particle spin become compromised just by the very existence of the unicorn. So it means that suddenly our many worlds interpretation happens to be a strictly wrong for any quantum system whatsoever, as soon as you involve the unicorn. So this is somehow, uh, with this we say that quant that many worlds interpretation is a sort of an all-in bet. Since you, add, uh, since you need to assume universality, as far as you don't find anything that that collides with that, you pretend that the explanation keeps going. But then suddenly, as soon as you find anything whatsoever, then all the former supposed explanations that, that appear to be compelling happen to completely fail. It's not that they get uh, slightly modified. They may just complete, be completely wrong because they all relied on the assumption of universality. OK. This is it. I finish uh, here. Finally, exhausted the hour. So, as a summary, uh, many will if 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 you buy the arguments that we exposed in the in this talk, then uh, you may agree that with the conclusion that many worlds interpretation does not account for empirical evidence of quantum mechanics, unless. The realistic hypothesis is strictly true. You rely on this assumption in order to account for each and every single experimental evidence. But since, as far as you agree also with uh, science being a human endeavor and therefore being limited and with the fact that we cannot be completely sure that we found the ultimate last theory uh, on Earth, the completely correct blue theory, then the holistic hypothesis cannot be verified. You are always open to the possibility that it gets falsified. But then, when this happens, many worlds interpretation is just fully refuted. It does not survive at all. It cannot say, okay, but this still can apply to quantum system. No, you can't anymore. Uh, and then this last uh, two remarks, uh, let me say that um, this sort of construction where you uh, take a theory and assume it as universal up to the point that anything, you can only, only conceptualize it within the theory, even empirical evidence. You cannot talk about empirical evidence anymore outside the theory because all empirical evidence are just subjective perceptions that you can only understand and you can only connect to a true ontology through the theory. 
um, these sort of theories, we believe they can obstruct the way to to the advance of of of, of um, natural science in the sense that you will be always more tempted to to resist on your own construction, even if you are seeing that the that empirical evidence is departing from it. And since the construction itself is so, um, say, um, uh, flexible, you will you will rather. And we give a, a concrete example in in the in the in the paper that I can that I can't go in detail here. You will rather turn to retort the argument to say, no, no, this still fits in the other theory because it's universal. It has to fit, rather than say, okay, no, this is. This, this lies beyond the scope of our, of our theory. And you will also resist to try to do that because if you do so, then according to my previous arguments, then you suddenly realize that your theory is completely lost. This is in blood and contrast with all the theories in which you the theory, the theory even if it doesn't, it doesn't embrace uh, universality, it still survives as an approximate accurate description of some phenomena like, for example, Classical mechanics, Newtonian gravity, or so on, right? And finally, uh, in in relation to what I'm saying, uh, some people say that, or say, or or tend to conceptualize that once you raise the possibility uh, that quantum mechanics may be someday overcome, this is somehow out of place in the sense that okay, but when it comes, it comes. But so far, quantum mechanics is so successful. Why would you? Why do on earth would you think that you need to think that it may be overcome? What what what's the role of thinking about that in the current status? Well, we do think that quantum mechanics is incredibly successful, but precisely because of that, it deserves to survive. And the conceptualization, the good conceptualization we do of it, the best conceptualization should be such that it does not depend on its strict universality. That we can understand properly what happens to a particle on a screen, thinking about the particle and about the screen, and that's all to it. And it doesn't depend on universality holding to anything that may, or on quantum mechanics holding to anything that may become affected with that, because this is a very unstable, a very um, it lacks the robustness that we believe quantum mechanics is, deserves precisely because of being so successful. So this is not, with this I finished, this work is far from being any, say, attack to quantum mechanics in the sense, oh, it's not a perfect theory. Rather the opposite, it's a tribute to quantum mechanics. It's a very successful theory. We better conceptualize it in a way that we can preserve it. And with this I'm finished. Thanks for the attention. So welcome everybody to the discussion Q&A. Um, the first hand I see is from Johannes. Johannes, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Louis. Thanks for this uh, very nice, interesting talk. I was just wondering if you know uh, Emily Ellum's argument on um, the problem of confirmation in erecting quantum mechanics. Uh, I feel like it's, it's a very similar approach to what you are doing. Uh, no, uh, to be completely honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but uh, I would be very happy if, 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 if you uh, <clears throat> if you provide me with a... Uh, with, um... I put the link in the chat. It, it, it is a lovely okay. paper. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, I would be it. happy to, 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 to check it and, and to... Uh, uh, yeah, and to, uh, and to compare it and to see what are, what are the similarities I would be... Thanks for the reference. Thank you. Um, to, just just to clarify, as a quick follow up to that, so Louise, uh, don't worry, you weren't scooped with this. Uh, <laughs> Emily's paper is complementary to your argument, I think, in a lot of ways, but it is a distinct argument. Um, it, it's basically an argument about how uh, once you assume a many worlds picture, how could you ever confirm or disconfirm it? Because everything that happens is within, you know, even even the unlikely experiments that seem to go against the Born rule are still within the many worlds picture. And so it's very difficult to sort of like see how you get out of it. That's a very, very coarse grained version of the argument. It's much more sophisticated than that. But I do highly recommend it. Johannes, it's okay. a very good su suggestion. Thank you.
I always have a long list of questions. So if uh, we don't have any current questions, I'm always happy to ask one of mine. Oh, Carl, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm not a defender in any way of um, Everettian picture, but if I were to trying to defend the view, I would say, why isn't um, a sort of internal self-consistency or coherence uh, a good enough um, a good enough result to to be satisfied with? I, even granting the the nature of this circularity or loop that you're talking about, and the as it were the impossibility of getting in there without making the assumption that that uh, the picture applies to everything. Um, still, you can make that assumption. And then once you do, everything works out rather marvelously, they would say. And and so why isn't that sufficient? Well, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, in my view, I think um, <clears throat> it has to do with uh, with uh, with a with a sort of approach. Uh, the, the arguments that we put of, of of the uh, uh, the approach to natural science as a result of human endeavor, it's like, and uh, and the attempt at any ontological proposal that we do uh, about nature is uh, about uh, the experiments that we really do with um, with a, with a, with a concrete experimental uh, objects we we treat in the in the in the real world, so to speak. I don't know if I'm uh, explaining myself quite well. What I mean is, yes, you can create a pure quantum universe that is completely self-consistent. That could be fine. I mean, it's okay and everything works nice there, but so far it's an universe of fantasy, so to speak. I would like uh, constructions that I can be sure that to some extent, at least, they are gonna be um, uh, fitting with concrete things I do here uh, in the in 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 the in in my experience of the uh, of, of nature, right? Uh, and in this sense, if you make this self consistency so uh, so fragile, and you require all the time that everything has to be strictly quantum mechanical for for uh, for um, for the concrete vessels to fit and to be consistent, then if if the things you do in the real world are not like that, you are in trouble because your universe is very beautiful, but it's not describing any concrete thing you do in any concrete lab, right? In Galileo's uh, room where he was doing experiments with the spherical balls, making them to roll and so on, there were quantum mechanical things going on, of course. Um, well, things that today we call them quantum mechanical didn't matter. Galileo's description or, or Newton's description is still a quite accurate description of the ontology of those rolling balls or those rolling spheres in any uh, slope that we can put yesterday and today. And they fit quite properly, regardless of what may be affected by that or whatever things that may be going in there. What, I, what we are trying to argue is that in the case of many walls interpretation, once you try to put it in action in some concrete experiment, if something around there happens to be post quantum, then the 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 even if if you're not being aware of it as much as Galileo was not aware of quantum mechanical things going around him, then you are in trouble. Then suddenly your explanation is not a correct ontological explanation of that what you are doing in the lab. It's a uh, it's what I would connect it with what they say at the beginning. It's a mental scheme. Some people may believe that this is what all what we can expect about science. I quite disagree. I think we I think quantum mechanics says much more. I think we should be possibly understanding quantum mechanics in a way that remains consistent for concrete quantum experiments, regardless of what we find later. That would be I hope that this has more or less clarified. Thanks. Carl. Uh, the next hand I have is from Manching. Please go ahead. Um, uh, thank, thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm quite sympathetic to a lot of the things that you said. Uh, so, but I, I think there are two different ways of people taking many world interpretations. So one way is to take it as a, a, a interpretation. So quantum standard quantum theory is a theory itself and many world interpretation is an interpretation. And there's also 
uh, many philosophers of physics, specifically Greek, would claim that standard quantum mechanics is not a theory. Quantum theory is only a theory if you uh, imbue it with, for example, the many world interpretation. I think your argument is quite convincingly uh, refuting the latter view of many world interpretation, but do you think it can still be a uh, a uh, many world can still be a good candidate for a plausible interpretation of the quantum theory, as in, uh, like competing for, for example, where you, uh, where you're competing with the GRW, then you can, it, yeah, it can still be decided by future empirical, uh, uh, ex experiments, whether uh, it, it can sway one way or another, right? So it does not affect uh, uh, what the empirical. Uh, evidence that we take to be the empirical evidence of quantum theory, but they can still uh, empirically determine which interpretation we should favor. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, thanks also for the question. Uh, I think it connects back again to what I uh, I said at, uh, at the beginning is yes, we are, we are, and you're completely right, we, we are addressing the second view that um, uh, that the uh, of many worlds uh, saying, okay, this is not just an interpretation in words of David Deutsch is, is really the ontology that is, that is behind in here. And, and all evidences we are finding of quantum mechanics are the, the, the fossils of dinosaurs and that make us to believe that dinosaurs existed. And, and so we, this is what we are attacking. The other view that, okay, many worlds is just an interpretation. Again, it depends on what one wants to mean. If one wants to mean a mental scheme, it can be useful in certain uh, circumstances. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it can still point to the correct uh, ontology, but then then the structure, maybe then it will depend on, for example, your view on laws of nature. For example, you can, it can very well be the laws of nature are uh, some uh, ontologically like real out there, but the way that, but it does not affect that we as human beings, science, science is still a human endeavor. It's so we, we still accumulate limited empirical evidence to in order to find such uh, laws of nature, right? But so so then uh, in, in this sense, many world uh, inter uh, interpretation can still be the correct ontology, even if, for example, the empirical evidence that we get to the correct ontology is um, yeah, we, we we don't get to to the it right away. So we uh, the, the, there are different steps that, but it can still be plausibly uh, if, if you take the view that laws of nature are uh, like a, truly governs the world. But of course, the human would uh, state otherwise. Then yeah, yeah, I I see what you mean. Yes, I mean if you have some sort of yeah. I don't know if it would be like primitivism of um, 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 on laws of nature. You could still argue, yes, I mean, it could be the case that, um, that yeah, that the laws of nature there exist. And even if we know them uh, only partially, they happen to embrace uh, uh, the ontology of, of many worlds interpretation. But in my opinion, and this is, again, the more you buy our <laughs> positioning on, on, on on, on what uh, natural science is about, this is just a belief. You are not, you're, you are always in expectancy that tomorrow happens, you happen to find what I called in the talk, the blue unicorn that happens to say, no, this does not fit in there. And then the problem is that you have no safe place to retreat, yeah. unlike with yeah, other I'm, ones. Yeah, I'm actually sympathetic with your view. I'm just playing devil's advocate yeah. here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan Shing. Uh, next hand happens from Simon. Simon, it's very nice to see you. Uh, yeah. Um, hi, Jacob. Hi. Thanks. It's been great. I really appreciated this talk. It threw up a number of interesting ideas and challenges. I mean, I find that uh, I want to say this is a kind of challenge that the average interpretation can meet, because unlike previous questioners, I would support the average interpretation. Uh, uh, but um, I'm slightly baffled at your main point. There's something about it that comes in and out of focus. So at one point, you speak of it being extraordinarily fragile, that Everett in quantum theory, that somehow 
were it to encounter some uh, hitherto form of matter that does not satisfy the superposition principle and is not quantum mechanical at all, that thereby the whole of quantum mechanics collapses. Well, I would have thought, well, exactly that is what we should conclude. So I, I'm sort of, and the more fragile quantum mechanics becomes under the average interpretation, surely the better a theory it is on any Popperian philosophy of science. It's precisely the strongest theory, the one that makes the strongest claims, that is the most fragile and vulnerable to disconfirmation. So this is a virtue of Everettian quantum theory. So in a sense, I'm just not really getting you. So I'm not, I'm sort of missing something. Um, but but let me say something else, which perhaps addresses a bit of what you're getting at, which I do find interesting. And I, perhaps there is something rather remarkable about this. Um, and in fact, my very parallels make me think so. So imagine our data about the stars and galaxies. All of that data is actually electromagnetic vibrations in passing through our atmosphere. None of it comes to us by any other means. Well, okay, occasional meteorites. Um, so on the basis of that, we extrapolate to the stars, the galaxies, and the known universe and so forth. Now, is that an enormous, is that not an enormous extrapolation of what we know in earthly phenomena? Is it not to suppose that all of those other sources of light that we think of them in terms of stars that obey the same laws that we see here in our terrestrial sphere or in our local solar system. So is this not a gargantuan dependence, an example of your holistic inference loop that, that conventional co cosmology, which is entirely based on these electromagnetic vibrations in the atmosphere, should make such extraordinary presuppositions on this vast universe that it unearths, all of which must cohere with, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I hope you see why I would have thought this is not a negative feature of what has gone on in cosmology. But you seem to say that it is. And so I'm sort of, again, I'm not really getting you, I'm not really getting this holistic inference loop. So, and a third thing, I may as well just say my piece, I'm sorry, but uh, a third thing on the issue of how do you teach quantum mechanics and Everettian quantum theory, how can you teach it? I think a crucial question is, does the Everett interpretation, Everettian quantum theory, give you back the measurement postulates? And I would have thought it does. It doesn't give them back as fundamental principles or anything like that. It gives them back as effective rules of thumb if you like, and perhaps more than that in the case of the Born Rule. So if it gives you those things back, then there is no harm to teaching the subject using those things, which you will later show are not fundamental. So, you know, I don't really, I mean, well, I think a great deal does depend upon whether Everettian quantum theory explains or underpins the measurement postures. I mean, <laughs> Many pro Everettians have 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 you know, almost characterized the position as renunciating, renunciating the measurement postulates. You know that they they're false and so forth. You know, and there would be something disturbing that in order to teach a subject, you had to use crutches that were just false. I mean, really, just out and out false. That doesn't seem quite right. But. So I think it's something does rest on this question of whether the Everett interpretation does give you back the measure, and I would say that it does. All right, sorry. So I, I've given you three reposts, um, uh, food for thought, uh, but anything you have to say, I would love to hear more. Um, Simon, it, would it be okay if I summarized your three questions just for everybody and also for Louise? So if I understand correctly, your first question is this fragility or lack of robustness uh, Louise is presenting as a bad thing, but it could also, on the other hand, be seen as a very good thing, as a, something making quantum mechanics a much more falsifiable theory, much more sensitive to being falsified by experiment, which improves uh, its criteria as a good scientific theory. Um, th the second question is, what exactly is meant here by the holistic inference loop, and why doesn't it apply to other kinds of scientific theories, in particular things like cosmology, where it seems like based on very limited evidence, uh, about you know stuff we're getting from from the stars to our atmosphere, we're making these wild extrapolations. Uh, and then the third question is: is is it is it immoral to to try to teach quantum mechanics using many worlds as a good pedagogical device? Um, and what are his thoughts on that? Do I have that roughly correct? 
Well, just on the last beauty yeah. project, on the last, is it not? Is it immoral to use as a pedagogical yeah, device? As a pedagogical device, exactly. Yep. Good. I think I I, I may uh, have a hunch about how Louise might answer some of these questions, but Louise, please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And so, uh, by the way, these are all the same. These are all on my these to the first two, not the third one, but the first two were on my list as well. So okay, you're, you're, nice. Louise is also uh, answering some of my questions too. Please okay. go ahead, Louise. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. I will. Uh, I will try uh, to uh, to be also short. Uh, we have five minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why. Uh, okay. Uh, so the first one about fragility. I think, uh, yeah, you can conceptualize the fragility of a theory about uh, as a good thing, but I I think, and again, this has to do with our uh, our view on how 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 natural science should should uh, should work as a human endeavor. It should be a fragility that has to do on finding its own limits, but. It should be desirable that a theory also is capable, and mostly if you are proposing it as an ontology, that is capable of, of finding a place where to say, okay, it happens to have failed for that, we have falsified it for that, and it's possibly falsifiable for these uh, phenomena, but it still works and it's an accurate description of these other phenomena, regardless of that having happened. And this is a property, for example, we could discuss whether classical mechanics is more or less fragile, but definitely we have happened to break it. Uh, but you can still understand, if you want some desired precision, you can still understand the solar system with that. And it's okay. I would say that that uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, classical mechanical concepts are, are applied correctly and they are revealing an aspect of the ontology, maybe not completely precise, maybe only partial, maybe only approximate, but they are revealing an aspect of the ontology of our solar system, and they will keep doing so. And in my opinion, quantum mechanics is so successful that the way we conceptualize it should have also that property. And in my opinion, many worlds interpretation happens to fail in that endeavor, in the sense that it's so fragile that when you find something that does not function with quantum mechanics, then as soon as you involve that around, and we don't know if these things are involved around us already, then you happens it happens to question your account of quantum mechanical experiments. You have, as I mentioned before, you have no place, safe place where to retreat and say, okay, but my theory is okay here. It can be as a <clears throat> it can be used as a as some uh, as some mental scheme, just as I said that you can say that the wind is coming from some wild creature. Uh, that is blowing, but this doesn't mean that the creature sees. And in the same fashion, it would be okay. Yes, you're using a mental scheme in your head where you imagine universes, but they are not there. They are not happening. They are not taking place in any concrete quantum experiment that you are doing. It's something else that is going on. And maybe thinking like that is preventing us to find this other thing that's actually happening. With respect to cosmology, I try to be quick. Sorry. Uh, I completely agree. I think, I, but I'm very skeptical about cosmology also. I happen to be quite skeptical. I think we have to be very cautious in making these extrapolations. They may work and maybe we don't have anything better so far, but it may, they may be incorrect. It may be the case that the very concept of a space, the way we understand it happens to fail at, at, at certain uh, uh, smaller, uh, smaller scales, but also as, as happens bigger scales, no? This typical question one does in the, as, as a child, okay, what does the universe finishes? No, that here is the end. Maybe it's something more crazy. It's maybe something that at some scales, not even the concepts of the space apply. This is something much more crazy. I don't know. Of course, we extrapolate as much as we can, but it may fail and we have to be open to that possibility. But the point is that the extrapolations will not compromise Okay, but maybe at the level of galaxies, we are still that, or maybe of cluster of galaxies, or maybe of, I don't know what, or maybe to this uh, period or in the in the history of the universe, we can use these concepts still consistently, although they fail in some place else. But we have the, the theories that we build reveal aspects of the ontology of our nature and reveal them consistently. And I think quantum mechanics deserves that. And also cosmological theories, that's why I... I'm skeptical about cosmology as a theory of the universe. I think cosmology is a theory about the bigger scale things that we have managed to explore so far, which is something different. 
Um, we have just one minute left. Uh, Simon, you re-raised your hand. Did you have well, one quick follow-up? Well, I, I, I did a little bit in that, um, um, I, I mean, an obvious fallback were, you know, the universality of this extraordinary risk that Everettian quantum theory is exposed to by virtue of its universal superposition, validity of superposition principle and so on and so forth. If the price of having that extraordinary, taking that risk were that the entire theory is destroyed without any remnant, did it fail? I, I can sort of get you a little. I would understand you're, you are wary of making quantum mechanics something tremendously fragile such that if there is a problem the whole thing is shattered into dust and you want it to be somehow compartmentalized just think and of the history of pessimistic meta induction right i mean <laughs> it, it is right. our practice that theories get you know subsumed but hopefully not totally thrown out right this would be a little bit new although i'm actually sympathetic to your view simon that that fragility is not necessarily a bug but, 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 right, but, hang on, but the unfortunate thing, and I think it both tells against me and for me, is that the fallback is always the measurement postulates, which is precisely your fallback too. So, you know, it's an, an illusion to think, oh my God, the whole thing will collapse because, and the very pedagogical device that I think needs to be preserved if quantum, Everettian quantum theory is to be acceptable or to make sense, uh, then that will be the fallback and it will be an entirely legitimate fallback. So I think your fears are misplaced. Um, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank everybody for participating. Of course, I want to thank Louise for giving a wonderful talk and leading a wonderful discussion Q&A. Thanks to all of our wonderful questioners. Thanks for spending your time with us. And thanks to Flavio, who's been tuning in from a train <laughs> on this talk. It's really great to see you, and I can see that you're on the, on the train. I'm glad the internet connection is working OK there. Um, all right, so it's wonderful to see all of you. Stay tuned for updates about the rest of the series. It is possible we'll have another event in the series before uh, the end of this academic year. If so, I'll make an announcement. Otherwise, we will be off and we'll be returning in the fall. Um, delightful to see all of you. Thank you. Be well and stay tuned. Um, this talk will be posted to the YouTube um, uh, channel shortly. Good to see everybody. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.